start with Clarissa. OK, so this is not a question that Clarissa was waiting for. Because, don't you love that? I'm starting right out with, hey, let's just, you know, I told you it was going to be like sitting at my dining room table. OK, so in a, a, another session that Clarissa and I were in, she said something that I had to tweet, then I had to put it on Facebook, and then I had to put it on LinkedIn because I couldn't stop thinking about it. And the statement was, social didn't change the culture at our company, it revealed it. And I was like, ooh, right, that's deep. It's like, take a minute, right? <laughs> So it was deep. Social <laughs> didn't change the culture, it revealed it. I would love for you to share more because at that time you really didn't get a chance to do that. So Sure. At, well, at Lowe's, we're a company very traditional, very conservative, um, started in the deep south, um, and over 65 years old. So as you can imagine, a very intense <coughs> command and control um, type of environment when we began this transformational change three years ago. And so um, in doing that, we, we recognize that the culture is, it's there, and it may not be this beautiful thing that you want to believe it is. And when, when we, we really uh, we allowed the collaborative platform connections to be available to all our employees, we heard things that maybe didn't, we, re, we realized people aren't as happy as we want to believe. But that was the reality, and that didn't change because we gave them the access to this technology. It was already there. Mm. And that was a real hard pill to swallow for some of our leadership, as you can imagine, because everybody wants to believe your employees are happy and that we're doing a great job. And, and the fact is, none of us are doing a perfect job, but how do we get better? It, it's, it's just the whole thing about exercise and diet, as Sandy talked about earlier today, you know, no pain, no gain um, is sort of what you think about. We're, we're not going to get better without acknowledging that there's a lot of opportunity out there for change. Um, and so it really, we wanted our leadership not to say, well, so, social media is bad. Social media has created a change in our people. No. It didn't change anything that it was it was like this before it's just now we are able to know about it and do something about it so that that was a real bitter pill to swallow but something we feel very passionate about and we've actually talked a lot about because a lot of people talk about social media has changed you know culture and at Lowe's we really believe it just revealed it and that may not be true everywhere but we really believe it it was there we, and there's a lot of great things about our culture, but things to really change for the future, we knew we needed to address things like we all do to, to really evolve for a new type of customer. And knowing that your organization, from what you shared earlier, is so transparent, and your CEO blogs, and it's, you know, it's, it's very integrated, did that decision or that understanding that, again, it was revealed as opposed to really building a, a new culture, did that come from the top down? Did you have that conversation from the CEO down? And then did, did that CEO then, did he share that aloud with everyone else, kind of calling out the elephant in the room? He absolutely did. Robert Niblock is our CEO. And I want to clarify one question someone asked me earlier today. Robert writes all of his own blogs. In fact, when he first started writing, he is such an exceptional writer. No one believed it was him. <laughs> so I, I talked with him and I said, Robert, you're such a great writer, no one believes this is you. You're going to have to be more conversational. Um, he's so articulate to a point where no one could believe it was actually him, so he became more and more conversational over time. It's not unusual for him to have a blog with 10,000 to 50,000 to 75,000 views. Um, and thousands of comments. And as I mentioned this morning, he constantly stays engaged at the table. He stays, he doesn't respond to every comment, of course. He's running a $50 billion company, but he does jump back into the conversation to address concerns that are elevated over and over again. So I think that's been key to his success um, in this space, but he's certainly our biggest champion as well as his leadership team have been, that is why we've been so successful, because it really started and was championed at the top. 
And I'd love to circle back a little later around that conversation about um, becoming more himself. The words I would use is becoming more himself, right? And that that actually allowed him to free himself up a little bit in terms of the way he communicated with the population. But I think that that's true for all of us. And I've heard that over and over again today around um, how much of yourself you'll reveal. And Jessica talked a little bit about that around personal brand. So I want to I want to circle back to that. So keep your thinking cap okay. on, Clarissa. Um, <laughs> it's another another one of those questions I didn't warn you about. Um, so, Sandra, there's, you know, I think, I think about the Pitney Bowes culture. I think about the employees. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, I was, at one point, I, I did some work with them further in my career. And, and I think, you know, if we, if we, there are a lot of us who have brands that if we said the name of the brand, people would have some thoughts around what employees might think, especially around <coughs> social media. Mm -hmm. So if I, if I read you the statement, it feels a little dangerous to allow our employee population to be to all to become agents of the company on social media. I think that's a fear that maybe those of you who are here, because you're more forward thinking perhaps than other companies, you may say it doesn't really apply to our company. We figured out a way around it. But I don't think that's true for everyone. Mm -hmm. So talk to us a little bit about how you, um, how you educate a population to actually represent your company and your brand. Great. So uh, I'm on the business development side. And um, ba basically, at Pitney Bowes, the philosophy is that they want to have everyone be empowered to be using social media. And the way that we're doing that is through a, a very broad brushed education program. So there's education and certification that's available as an option to all employees. And there's, there's actually uh, a very structured program where it's um, different certification levels. So I'm actually going through that myself. I, consi I consider myself, um, really, from a social media perspective, a continuous learner. Uh, a lot of background with LinkedIn because I'm in a B2B company. A lot of you might be from B2C. Mm. Um, but being a B2B company, um, LinkedIn's been very important to us. And, but, but on the, um, all of the other social channels, we are deep into all the social channels. Um, but um, we wanted to make sure that our people were able to be ambassadors. So we have a council across different business units. We have um, various business units. We're in the software business, and we've got services and hardware, different businesses. So we make sure that everyone's in sync through this um, st strategic council, and then the, the training program that, um, that we open up to our employees. Can you give us an example of what that training program looks like, what some of the courses are? What could an employee expect? Okay, so there's different levels of the program. Um, the first level is all about engagement and listening. And so we start there and we want to make sure that uh, all of our folks are good listeners and that they understand that the, the, the main goals of the company and of what we're trying to achieve with social media. Then the second, there's, there's uh, all different classes that are a part of it and we do you know, blogging classes, all, all the different um, you know, SlideShare, YouTube, Pinterest, all of it is part of the program. That's great. And so is the feedback that they're using it both for business and for pleasure? Are they, how, are they, are they encouraged to build their own personal brand? How does that work? You know, it's, um, I'd say that the focus is really business. And uh, we have a lot of different parts of the company doing different things. So, we, you know, it's very important that we think about what makes sense from a strategic perspective. You know, if you're a particular business unit, um, we want to make sure that we're all having the same conversations and that we're using the right channels. Mm. So should we, for example, um, why I'm doing the, I myself and my I have some employees in business development that are going through the training so that we can decide some of the areas that I have responsibility for. Do I need to set up our own separate presence or do we p become part of mm. pb.com and what Pitney Bowes is doing on Facebook and everywhere else? So. And, and that conversation, is, that, is it collaborative at this point? So everyone has, a, has the opportunity to weigh in around, I would imagine there's some territorial, if I, if I go through the certification yeah. and I yeah. have learned to blog, then right. I, I want to own it. Right. So we have, uh, we have uh, quite a few people that are, that are blogging. I don't know the exact number. But um, yeah, we, we like to have, we like to kind of really know who those people are, obviously. Mm -hmm. And then, but we, everyone is out there as a um, empowered employee. Love that. So. Love that. So ladies, talk to us about the biggest misconception of social media and business. It's all opinion, but give it to us. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I think to add to what you were just asking, Sandra, um, is one of the conversations that we had early on when we first introduced connections to our workforce, a lot of our field leadership were very uncomfortable. As you can imagine, that's where the bulk of your employees are, and they weren't trained. Um, they were just, they were trained to be Lowe's employees on the sales floor. They weren't trained to be articulate in social media. So the worry was, well, what are they gonna say? So one of our senior leadership, when we were at our sales meeting, as we introduced this platform said, I just wanna know who is going to gatekeep this? Hmm. Are you going to gatekeep 250,000 people? I said, absolutely not. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, are you crazy? <laughs> I said, no. I said, didn't you hire these employees? He said, yes. I said, so we don't trust them? These are the people that interact with our customers every single day. Mm -hmm. And if we can't trust them to talk to us internally, there's something wrong with this picture. And um, it, it startled this gentleman. He, he didn't know quite what to say. And he, he still was just very upset. So I think the, you know, the biggest misconception is that it's, it's going to change that about people. You, mm. You've got to trust. And if, if there's something wrong and you can't trust, then you've hired the wrong people. Um, because the transparency will reveal all of that. Um, and, and I think it, it does become very self-governing. And I believe me, there were days when I have panicked in the early stages of this. <laughs> I mean, some of our first communities were zombies. Um, so you can imagine, early, in the early days of Connections, I walked into a meeting planning to go talk about our international sales meeting, and the executive said, I don't want to talk about the sales meeting. What I want to talk about is zombies on connections. <laughs> and I said, okay. Um, and, you know, it's all about letting, letting people come to work and be who they are. They're, they're, we don't monitor dialogue in the cafeteria or anywhere else on the campus. You've got to let people be who they are. And especially, we've talked a lot about demographics today, the connected generation expects that they demand it and they expect it and it's really the right thing it really allows people to give their best and be the most productive so i think that is one of our our best learnings is about learning to trust learning to self-govern um, one of the other other early conversations was after we first allowed connections there was a lot of discussion it was right after super bowl weekend <laughs> and the store operations folks were like, I can't believe they're, they're out there talking in forums and blogs about Super Bowl. And I said, do you think they've never done that before? <laughs> <laughs> really? And I said, it's probably a pretty social thing on Super Bowl weekend as customers are coming in. That's probably not totally out of line. And they said, but they're, you know, what, 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 what are they, what would they be talking with customers about? And I said, can't you imagine that they're also contributing expertise? We, we had a lot of people who started what were considered zombie communities or other things that you would say, wow, that's a little crazy. But what we found wa was that those very same people were very active sharing knowledge and expertise in business areas like millwork or kitchen cabinets. So they were just social people and they were sharing knowledge. It just so happens they're people beyond being millwork specialist or appliance specialist. But that's what it's all about. What you can't do, in our opinion, I think we've been very successful because we've allowed all of that. We haven't tried to say, you can only talk about business. And believe me, I got a lot of pushback about that. I'm sure. It, and, and you just can't, if you really want to be successful, you can't just limit it to that, in our opinion. We think that's been a key to our success. Yeah, that's, so. that's, I think that's a huge misconception. Um, you know, you nailed it right on the head. It, it, if I'm thinking about a retail community and I'm thinking about allowing these hundreds of thousands of, of employees to just get on social media, I can hear where the, the resistance would be, right? And this is all about resistance and managing resistance. Right. That's really what we're talking about here. And you're, and mm -hmm. you're managing it with trust. So I like that, exactly. which will come back into the hiring practices, which we're going to talk about in a second. But I'm wondering if you have a, something you want to share with people around misconceptions that went on. So I guess uh, 
the misconception, you know, being that, that we're a business to business company. Um, we look at, you know, we, we are involved in social media and get highly engaged in social media because our customers are there and our customers are business customers, just like consumer customers. Mm. Um, that's why we're there. Um, but we also ha have connected that to our value proposition. If you think about our company, we're a 90 year old company and we're, we're known as the mail company, <laughs> postage meters. And um, we do a lot more than that around the mail, the envelope, and I heard folks talk nicely about loving mail, we like that too. <laughs> um, but we've always had those conversations about how to you know, address the, the envelope and how to do all those kinds of things. But now the conversations we have about mail are how to connect that to digital and how to make sure that your envelope has got the color and the graphics and that you've got the QR code that's going to your YouTube or to your Facebook page or what have you. So we know that to make mail relevant, it's tying it into the digital and tying it into social media. So it's really the two sides. It's, it's the, our customers are there, and then part of our value proposition is connected mm -hmm. with social media. Makes so much sense. Uh, in fact, it was, it's a fascinating conversation watching the evolution yeah. of a brand who, you know, and I think there are a lot of, of companies that, and organizations that have spoken up today that I've heard in conversation around brands around compliance, around certain issues in the financial industry, in the, um, in the pharmaceutical industry, and things that a lot of times there's a, con a, a misconception of we can or we can't do this. And it's because everyone says we can or can't do this. I had a great conversation with Allison about things that people said we can't do. And um, I, I can't see you now, Allison. I don't see you. Is Allison, is Allison out there? Um, Allison from, um, from Bristol Myers Squibb. And we were having a conversation about um, the belief that, well, our executives won't like that. Well, why, have you asked them? You know, have you actually asked them? And the answer was, well, no. You know, and she said, well, let's go ask them. You know, and I, it was so refreshing to me that um, you know, a lot of times it, we just, we don't, the misconception is we actually just don't have the information. Mm -hmm. um, and, and watching a brand evolve like that, I think, is, is fantastic. So uh, I want to shift gears a little bit to one of my pet peeves. In the world of social media, I think there's a lot of conversation around um, getting started and what the right channel is to be on and what um, what our ROI is as we you know jump out of the gate and we measure we measure we measure how have your organizations managed the ongoing right so in my in my mind there's a need to continue to delight the customer I don't think anyone here would argue with me right so whether it's business to business or it's con business to consumer there's this need to continue to delight to inform to educate and then also to retain them Right, so you get them to, to join you on social media in a conversation, how do you keep them there? Can you talk about some of the conversations that you may have had as an organization and how you're addressing things like that? And are you asking particularly about the measurement piece, how we... Not necessarily, if that's, if that's the way that, that your organization goes about it. I'm thinking, in my mind, I'm thinking more about uh, the continual community management and the engagement with those individuals who maybe today had a customer service issue and then how you bring them back into the fold and is there a plan for how you continue that conversation with that group of people who may or may not have just popped in once or popped in twice, especially on the consumer, but also on the business to business side? I think in our case, it, it became very competitive. Um, for example, one of the, the business areas that was not as on board early on were our merchants. And I think they felt like who needs social business and what what good could it do us well we we got one of the merchants really excited who started doing videos about the new products they were bringing out for seasonal living and that sort of thing and they started getting great results in terms of for example clearance of patio um, was one of the categories and it was amazing how the rest of the merchants started paying attention because we had this one real big win, it became a competitive thing. It's like, well, if they can do it, we can too. So we just start, if you find somebody who can be your champion in a business area, I think that's so important um, because you can tell the story over and over and over and, and we all do, but I think finding someone who is, is in a business area that really gets it and that's why We've had, we have connections, champions throughout the businesses that we really, we really 
try to get them excited about the great things they're doing, and then they become the best advocates in their business area, much stronger than we can be, because they know that part of the business. So that, that's been really critical for us as far as keeping people on board and then getting people over that hump of having doubt about really the validity and the proof. All of a sudden, they believe it because someone else in their business area has, has seen results because of it. That's great. Thank you. How, does, it, does it change for business to business? Um, well, for us, you know, with our, with our training, it's across all of our businesses. So we have all of our, our silos come together. And I think that really is helping us um, you know, with those ongoing conversations. And that we're, we're finding that I could be on a, a program with, with folks that I would never normally have a, a daily interaction with, and I can find out what they're doing, and we can sort of decide what we're going to maybe do together in the future. That's been something that's really helped us and really, can, and really sort of push us faster you know, by, by collaborating more. And the, mm. the training has done that. That's great. And so talk a little bit about if, if you could, um, those who didn't want to, didn't want to play, right? So those employees who just weren't interested, is that an option? Can I opt out as an employee? What do we do with people who are not in a circle of influence in that way? So, you know, I'm not the person who designed all this. I have to give, we have an amazing <laughs> group of people that are very talented um, who, who did this. But uh, I'd say that it's very pervasive in all the marketing folks across all the different lines of business, but, and also with HR people, because we're doing a lot of recruiting. But what I think that the change is that it's going to be, it's, it's going much beyond that into the product people, mm. much broader than people who you'd think of as normally being, you know, the ones that are engaged with social media. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I'd like to turn to the, to the third the third panelist, which is all of you. Gosh. I know that there are. <laughs> so welcome, you're now on the spot. You, this, this is your moment to shine. Uh, is there someone in the audience who is an HR professional or does a lot of hiring, comes from the recruiting organization, who wants to talk a little bit about how your, how your brand is being perceived and how things have started to change because you're using social in the business of recruiting? Anyone want to stand up and share with the group? Be our third panelist for a moment? We're a boutique firm, um, but we have shifted um, since 2008 um, for a number of different reasons. One is because the demand for digital talent has changed. Um, so what you're looking for is different than what it was prior to 2008. So it required that we change our strategy around how we look for people. So what we found is that people want to engage more online, digitally. Um, obviously, we use all the social media tools, but people want to have more conversations. So we But wait, one second. That's not so obvious. So it's, uh, this is one of those worlds where sometimes we take things for granted. So obvious to you, maybe obvious to me, maybe obvious to a few people. Talk a little bit about which tools you are using. Oh, sorry. No, um, no, no, not, not an apology. More of, I can see it's clearly ingrained in the way you so do So we use Twitter. So we have a Twitter handle, but we will also um, use hashtags around things that we're looking for. So if it's a job title, we use, you know, hashtag hiring. If it's for a job title we're doing, if it's for trends and it's different things. It's If it's for marketing or if it's for a category of business, if it's pharmaceutical or if it's automotive, when we use, that we use hashtags for people that, so they can follow that category of interest. Um, and then we will follow companies and people that we think are connectors and people that people want to just follow because they're influential in the industry and have a lot to talk about. So we follow them and respond to them and talk about things that are of importance. And because we're in the talent business, um, there's a girl that works with me. We're both um, professional coaches. So she keeps an eye out on professional development articles and information on career development, how to interview, how to uh, manage up, work-life integration. So we do articles and, and retweet and send information out to really help people navigate whether it's you know how to transform your career, how to fix your resume, things that, mm -hmm. that's out in the universe so that we wanted to position ourselves to be subject matter experts around that. So they come to us, even if they're not looking for a job, but just to stay current around trends in the industry. I work in digital marketing and digital media in general. Um, I've learned a lot working with the recruiting team on their special needs for these channels. 
Um, and probably the biggest advice I tend to give any group is not to jump into every channel. You don't need to be on every one. Um, but we've found a great benefit being in Facebook to reach um, the younger recruits. <coughs> That's definitely where they are. Um, LinkedIn has been more beneficial for more experienced and seasoned professionals. So we tend to skew the job listings uh, related to those positions more in LinkedIn. Um, so I think, again, looking at your channels and seeing who's out there and where the conversations are helps you figure out where to post your jobs and find your best talent. So that's just another consideration. One of the things we're on um, Twitter and LinkedIn and YouTube, we are not actively pursuing Facebook right now for a recruiting purpose. We have a great brand page if you haven't visited Target on Facebook. <laughs> um, but one of the things from a recruiting perspective that we have started in the last 12 to 18 months is an employee blog. And we've selected people from different business groups within the organization that we find are traditionally harder for us to hire in. And that's the content that we're using in our social media. So we're getting those posts, getting the fresh ideas from the people doing the job every day. And instead of always posting just job listings, it's here's what it's like to work as a buyer for Target. So it's a day in the life of a yeah, buyer. Exactly. That's and it comes with really pictures great. and videos that's and um, the just, you know, off the cuff. It's authentic, and that's my biggest thing with our brand too. That's great. That's and then awesome. and then are they um, are they part of the recruitment process as well? So if I identify with Susie and I really like what she's talking about in her buyer position, can I access her as, an, as a candidate? Yeah, so you can post, uh, you can comment on that person's blog and my team manages to make sure that the communication gets back to that person and shares with them. And then we also have a recruiter buddy with that person so that they can get involved in that conversation as well. Um, and certainly, they. Um, somebody said you kind of become uh, the idols, like you, you see the bloggers walking through the Target building. Oh, I feel like I'm your best friend because I read about your job yesterday. So um, it becomes part of, we point them out when they're in the building for, uh, for interviews and that type of thing. That's great, thank you. I know that both of you are very deeply ingrained and believe in what's happening at your organizations. I know um, on some personal level, you're also very involved in some you know, outside things that you do that are really passionate to you, whether that's volunteering, whether that's, um, whether that's some, some work that you might be doing. In, uh, San, Sandra, for example, writes for an industry magazine, and so there's an opportunity there for a celebrity that kind of steps outside of Pitney Bowes, but still related as an agent of the company. If you could talk a little bit about the way that you're, um, the way you manage actively your personal brand, what that looks like for you, how much, um, how much you share personal versus uh, professional, how much, of, how much of those social media channels, how many of them you use, and I know this is simply just personal and opinion, but I think uh, we talked a lot about that today, and we certainly got Jessica's view on, on how, um, how she operates in her, in her world. And I, I thought it'd be interesting to hear from a corporate perspective how you might be using that, and I'll be asking all of you as well. So be ready, other panelists. Okay. I am um, I'm active in Facebook and Twitter personally. Um, I, I've been at, at Lowe's for quite a number of years and worked in investor relations, corporate communications, <laughs> all the traditional. So I always think about very seriously anything I post um, because I do value my reputation and I want to make sure what I portray to the outside world um, as for Lowe's as well as for my own family and, and my personal brand. So I always think about it could be on the front page of the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post. Um, I, I do consider that. It doesn't mean I don't ever post anything at all that's not personal. I, I do. Um, I believe we have promoted a, um, a transparency and a culture of candor um, at Lowe's. And so I do believe it's about being authentic. But I am mindful um, because I don't want things to be taken out of context and I do value my personal brand and reputation. So I, th I think that's something I tell my children every single day. They're 16 and 18 year old boys. Um, I remind them constantly, <laughs> what you say on your Facebook, just would you love to read it in, on the front of the Washington Times or the New York Post or yeah. Wall Street Journal because that's the reality of today. Um, and, and they faced that within their own world as far as some of the things they've encountered, so they know it's very real. So that, that's sort of my take on it. And it's, um, obviously that's your take, and, and based on your background especially in PR and investor relations, you understand that on a level that many, 
14-year-olds and 34-year-olds wouldn't. Mm -hmm. uh, do you find that your organization also promotes that? Are there conversations around how to manage that? One of the things we've done quite a bit with our, with our workforce is we talk a lot about what do you want your online reputation to be? Because we will have people, of course, with 250,000 people, you do have people that push the envelope. I will say we've had very, very few, I could put them on one hand, the number of posts that we've taken down. Um, there have been, but with that said, there have been some that are uncomfortable. But, you know, we, we have written, our team has written a lot of blogs about your online reputation and what do you want to be famous for? That's sort of our line. Mm -hmm. What do you want to be known for? What do you want to be famous for? And that seems to resonate. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's where we've sort of taken it. It's not to punish people um, or dismiss people. It's really to try to help them understand and learn and think more about themselves and what image they're portraying, and it really is about their online reputation and what they're famous for. As I mentioned, the, Amer the Lowe's Idol. I mean, we, we believe that. You, you really can go far with the online reputation you create, but that's up to you. That's great. Sandra? So it really resonates what, what you're saying about you know, know. being careful. Uh, I, I, my, my children are in their 20s, and the same thing, whether it's social media or even email, constantly reminding them that what you put on email and tell them that when they go to college because what you know they don't even think about the fact that they're writing these things down and that they can be shared so it's a, I really agree with that so I, I use uh, like use LinkedIn very extensively uh, I love LinkedIn and um, fairly new to Facebook just a couple you know three or four years and Twitter going through the process now of, of figuring out from a business perspective the business parts that I'm responsible for how I'm going to be engaging as related to the rest of Pitney Bowes. So that's happening right now. And then, um, you know, from a personal perspective, thinking projects that I've got going on and how, do I, how am I going to be bringing those out. So um, that's why I'm thrilled to be actually here and meeting a lot of you folks and getting a lot of great ideas. That's so. great. We'll look forward to your projects Thank you. as they come down the road. So you have a question, yes. Yeah, uh, to that end, especially um, with Clarissa. And could you give us your name and oh, your company? Uh, Diane with Sotheby's International Realty. Um, we're in a political, a very heated political season, and I'm wondering, uh, A, how does Lowe's deal with that? Uh, B, just in general, um, I... I want my opinion out there because I'm so concerned about this election. So I have taken the risk of putting my opinion out there. And I feel that for myself, because I'm basically self-employed but under you know, the name of Sotheby's, um, listen, if, if you don't like it, OK, fine, you go elsewhere. But I know that major corporations have, you know, they have guidelines about this. So I was wondering for both companies, how do you handle that? And then in general, you know, what's your advice to people? I am who I am, is how I look at it. So you talk about the transparency, um, you know, you take it or you don't. That's part of the challenge. Mm -hmm. Ladies? Sure. I will have to say, I have not personally made any, I have not tweeted, I have not posted anything on Facebook around anything to do with the political um, or the election. Um, because I feel like what I say could be referred, Lowe's could take, have to take responsibility for, and I don't think that's fair. Um, I'm very comfortable with what my position is, but I, and I'm also very comfortable with what everybody else is, their positions are as well. So I'm not judgmental of others, and so I, I don't want to, it's not about that for me. Um, is there a guideline that tells you that, that or suggests that you do or do not do that? Are there certain areas that should not be discussed, favorite, you know, from favorite NASCAR driver to favorite baseball team to politics? Our guidelines really are around not, nothing that is confidential, not unethical, um, those sorts of guidelines. So none of, nothing to do with politics is unethical. Um, or the com you could make an unethical comment, but just saying that you're for or against something doesn't make it unethical. So there's nothing that says I can't. I okay. choose not to. Okay. Um, but that well, some, the rumor is that some corporations are guiding their employees how to vote and all the rest. Absolutely not. If 
that was the culture that you were seeing in your, you know, not, not so mm. for Lowe's at all. Okay. And Sandra, you're saying no as well? No. Um, I'm hearing you go, mm, no. No, yeah, no. But we had a, a, a post that was just, I believe, this week about some so a software data study. Um, and it had to do with a uh, difference, red states versus blue states. And it was just a, d a data point, and it was it pointed to a uh, study. And there was someone who came on, the po who made a, a, po a post on there about, a political post about the candidate of their choice. So we left that on there because, again, we didn't, we're not making those kind of statements, but sometimes our customers would come on or our, our fans would come on and make comments, and we, you know, we leave them. So, but we don't go out and do that. So since we've begun the questions, are there other questions for the panelists? Okay. One of the challenges I have trying to sell the idea of social media to our business partners is more around the, the regulation of data in general and the fact that some industries, financial, I think I heard Bristol Myers Squibb having a similar issue that we have. We can't share people's information. We Absolutely. can't give an opinion because it could, could get, have you know, liability issues for us. So whenever I try to sell this idea of social media, I always get the pushback from our business folks as to, well, we can't get involved with that because we could, that could damage our reputation. You know, and, but the, the, chat, the conflict is when you look at the, the Gen Y population, they'll share pictures of what they're about to eat for dinner. They'll tell you exactly what happened at their last doctor's appointment on Facebook. Right. <laughs> and they'll blame anyone for anything, you know? And, and so how, as an industry like healthcare or like financials, mm -hmm. do we try to deal with that type of conflict? We Put have a spot. community that is um, owned by our HR Shared Services. And they have, I think, 36,000 members of that community. And they share things there that are broad mass communications. They said that they're still doing a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations around personal confidential data, of course, <coughs> but it has alleviated the need for back and forth dialogue around the mass communication. So it's certainly not the answer, I think, for everything and in related to something that's confidential, but it can alleviate where you have broad-based mass communications. Um, I think it, it can help there and help have a dialogue and help alleviate or add meaning and understanding around those things. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And I want you to give yourselves a round of applause for being our third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh panelists yeah. as well. I appreciate that. Multiple perspectives are always important. So thank you very much. And I'm going to turn the program back over to Carol.